there's just not enough information of the fact that people do get um, locked up for something they're really not guilty of. That there are, um, <coughs> they use persuaded, I use forced confessions. Mm -hmm. You know, the fact that anybody that's got a mental health issue can be played. You can be manipulated. Anybody that's an alcoholic addict can be manipulated. And there needs to be guidelines on how far they can push at any time of interrogation. If you start seeing that the individual is having a breakdown, Leave them alone. Give them some space to breathe. Don't keep pushing. And I really don't think there should be any, in any state, any county, any government, where a psychiatrist can be used as a sheriff. I don't think that should ever be permitted. Or any kind of law enforcement. I just don't think that's right. You know, because your doctor is supposed to be somebody you can trust with everything. And then for them to be able to use bits and pieces out of what their notes say or what their files say. It's just not right. I There's too much that's done wrong and it's not just Nebraska. It's just unfortunate that Nebraska was one of the seven states that did not have a compensation law. And it's, I'm sad that it had to be me that's mm -hmm. going through fighting for it, but I'm also grateful that I am able to stand up and say, uh-uh, this ain't happening. I don't want to see it happen anymore. I also feel that when there's a female being interrogated, that there needs to be a female in that room. I don't care if it's a minute investigation. Of, oh, look, I just need to ask you a couple questions. You need a, a female in there to make sure that, you know, cops are going to come across of knowing everything anyway. <laughs> but there are some women, especially in my case, if you've had a dysfunctional interaction with males in your past, you're going to feel a little bit more vulnerable. You're going to feel bullied. You're going to feel uh, belittled. And they need to have a fe Even if the female don't say nothing, just the presence of a female in that room, I think would have made it easier on me. Um, due to the fact that I come from a very dysfunctional, abusive family. My stepfather was abusive, so having a Somebody, well, we know you did this and did it, you know, get right dead in your face. You're going to back down and say, okay, I guess I did. You're, you're going to revert into, okay, let me let me please you. Let me do what you need to, what I need to do to make you happy. You know, sometimes, you know, people who um, continue to be interrogated time after time after time, and each time they know a little bit more about that particular case. But when a jury only sees the final product, it looks as though the person who confessed knows an awful lot of detail about the crime. In reality, and again, I say sometimes this is even inadvertent. Uh, if police officers who know very well what happened in the scene of the crime know that the person who's confessing gives a bit of information that is inaccurate, they may, without even realizing that they're doing it, um, give them a sign that that was inaccurate information. They may correct them. Um, they may actually tell them the information was wrong. They may raise an eyebrow. They may sigh. Um, or they may, you know, there's a, there's a number of things that they could do to let them know that that information was inaccurate. Um, right. The other thing that they do, and Joanne just reminded me, is, is sh has allowed them to see the crime scene which again gives them a lot of information that, that most people would not have had prior to that time. I think the solution for that is having interrogators who know very little about their, I mean, it sounds really ironic, and it's very difficult to do, especially in smaller towns, but if you can have interrogating officers who are not already intimately involved in the crime scene, who don't know, who aren't able to inadvertently feed information to the confessant, um, come in and do in, in, do the interrogation, um, we have a much higher chance that the information that the defendant is going to give us is accurate, whether or not they did it or didn't.
Videotaping is one great way to start, but I think that it's really just the tip of the iceberg. I think especially when you talk about in terms of false confessions, one of the best places to go is to actually um, give some education to law enforcement officers on recognizing false confessions. Um, one of the things that has been shown if law enforcement officers who are trained in recognizing a false confession versus an actual confession um, can come in after a confession is obtained and they themselves can look over that confession, um, they'll have much more of the tools to be able to identify whether or not that confession is legitimate. The idea that confessions are videotaped on the one hand gives us at least a, a look at what's going on in the interrogation room. But again, it's, it's not really enough. It's not... Um, where we need to, I mean, you can still have a false confession and especially um, persuaded false confessions. I mean, the, the interrogation may be very um, easy, right? I mean, there, there may not be tactics that are seen as coercive or um, even really very pushy. But if we have convinced the person themselves that their memory is faulty, um, then video and audio taping that confession is really not going to give us any information. What might give us some information, though, is that once we can obtain that confession, if internally law enforcement officers are able to look at the confession and point out spots where that confession may be problematic or false. So I, I really do think that that's probably the best for law enforcement th themselves. And they do. I mean, there's a lot of law enforcement agencies that really recognize that this is a problem. They don't want to convict innocent people for the most part. Um, and them taking the bull by the horns and saying, we're going to internally check ourselves, make sure that the confessions that we get are accurate, are good, before we ever put them in the hands of a prosecuting attorney. I also feel that, you know, the way the interrogations are done needs to change. There needs to either be more documentation or shorter time spans because when I was arrested, they came in in the middle of the night, got me. I was not allowed to put shoes on. I was in my pajamas, and it was cold. <laughs> I got arrested in uh, March of 89. But it's just the way they come across. I know they've got a job to do to push to get their confessions or to get the facts. They need to be able where they can't feed the facts to anybody. Like, I agree with Rebecca. They. The interrogator doesn't need to know all of the facts of the case. Maybe, you know, some of the ones that haven't been publicized that only the actual perpetrator would have an idea of. And they should never be able to take the individuals to a crime scene on a, on a capital crime like this. They should not show them the video. They should leave it to what they can get as fact, not give you all the information and say, okay, now you've got the information, feed it back to me. On one of my interrogation tapes, it's on the internet. I haven't listened to it. I won't listen to it. I refuse to. There is a part of the tape. You can hear the officer cut the tape off, turn it back on and say, now tell me what I told you to say. Mm. I don't think they should be allowed to do that. I also need to think that, uh, not only the interrogation, but the way that officers can walk through the jail and make little nonchalant comments of, we can put you on death row. How would you like that? You can be the first person on death row. What's that going to do to your kids or your family? Wait a minute. Your family suffers. Everybody that's locked up, whether it be for a day or 20 years, that family suffers just like the person that's inside does. And that's what a lot of people don't realize. They don't see that the family still suffers. But it's just, the system has got some flaws. And I know I'm only one voice, but sometimes that one voice will start getting somebody to listen. And that's what I'm hoping to do.